Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, 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 it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Wilder Ride, Getting Wilder by the Minute, a podcast that celebrates the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. And for season two, we are diving into Blazing Saddles one, excuse me while I whip this out, minute at a time. I'm your host, I'm Alan Sanders. I am your coast. <laughs> you are our coast? Ah, I did not drink enough today. I am your co-host, Walt Murray. Do you want me to redo that? No, I'm keeping it just <laughs> like that. I was afraid of that. <laughs> and joining us back today for Thursday, we have Father D- <laughs> Father, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> we have Father David Mowry. Welcome back. As your spiritual authority, I urge you to heed the words in this holy book. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, you're on your own. <laughs> Well, I haven't heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from the wife, my my friends, my enemies. The legal oh, system. The legal system. <laughs> do I need to get my stall out here? Do we need do we need to have to kick Walt off the, the uh the session here, Alan? Have some personal oh, counseling oh. time. I do. I feel like it. I'll just sit quietly and listen. Oh, okay. That's not, that I can't see anything that go wrong with that. <laughs> All right, well, let's continue this minute uh, 29 here where Bart gets down off of his horse in a very dead quiet town. They're all staring at him still. He's going to, uh, from that moment, walk up to the podium and we are going to end this minute with the Reverend Johnson saying, son, you're on your own. So let's go ahead and continue on with where we were yesterday. And Father, I'll, I'll, I'll let you run with this one. You actually uh, noticed that when we pointed out yesterday that the guy that folds his arms is the one who pulled the sign down. Bart actually gives him a pretty good stare down after he pulls the uh, the welcome sheriff sign back down. He is looking right at him and knowing now after my innocence has been shattered that there was actually human agency involved in <laughs> drawing the sign up. This moment makes so much more sense. He is choosing to look at this man with his arms folded as a deliberate middle finger. Like, oh, okay, well, you think you can make me feel unwelcome? Well, I'm just going to pull the sign down anyway. Yeah, if you go to hillbillydictionary.com and look up stink eye, <laughs> that's the scene you get. That He gave him the stink eye. <laughs> hillbillydictionary.com. Which I'll be putting online later today. <laughs> So instead of the urban dictionary, we have a hillbilly dictionary, do we? <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> we just you don't find anybody literate enough it's, to actually write the definitions. <laughs> it's just a bunch of X's. <laughs> it's like when Mongo signs just rip paper. <laughs> just make my mark. Sign here, please. Well, I love what this move says about Bart's character in this moment, that he is he is not put off. He is as cool as a cucumber, and he is always able to make the best of a bad situation. He always finds a way out, whereas I would have been overcome with crushing social anxiety and hightailed it out of there had I been in Bart's shoes. He runs headlong right into it and is just going to directly confront this obviously hostile crowd. Father, I have to ask, can you give us uh, the analogy maybe of David in the lion's den here? No, because it would be Daniel in the lion's den. That would be it, wouldn't it? I'm going to ask that again. Nope, I am it. not going to leave that. <laughs> so, Father. Yes, Alan. Would there be a story here dealing with Daniel in the lion's den? It's it's similar. I think a with Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel refuses to kneel to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar. And so he gets uh, thrown into the lion's den and left to be <laughs> eaten. This seems more like uh, Jesus overturning the tables in the temple to me, where he is directly confronting the status quo and making it known that, no, I'm, I'm here to set things the way they're supposed to be. This welcome sign should be down. Oh, 
And that's I didn't even think about it that way, because the reason I, I brought up Daniel is because initially, you know, we've got him being sent to, you know, he's going to be he's first of all, way, 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 way back. He's not supposed to get up and hit somebody in the back of the head with a shovel, does it anyway, and is going to be sent to the gallows and is at the last minute given a reprieve. And now he's got to go walk into this, 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 this den of vipers, all these people that have given him the stink eye. So that's the first thing that popped into my head. But you're absolutely right. I think as an authoritarian figure trying to bring law and order mm-hmm. or, you know, the purpose of this house to this town, mm-hmm. that is a really good analogy of him uh, saying, we're going to set things right in, in Rock Ridge. He is, he is brimming with confidence. He is just the man for the job. And in some ways, he has nothing to lose because, like you said, Alan, he was headed to the gallows. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. So if this doesn't work, I mean, he, he's dead. So he's going to go in there and do his best to make this work. Yeah, when you've already faced the worst thing that could happen, you're not really scared of anything after that. That's a that's another good point. And obviously, we've made the social commentary about what it was like to be on the railroad. We saw how Lyle and his group treated the railroad workers. And then, you know, it's not exactly like they've had an easy life. So he's right. he's used to dealing with adversity. But what we've seen since the very beginning of the movie Bart is is very quick on his feet and able to navigate through that adversity. That is correct. That must have been really, really good. You guys just sat there in stunned silence. Like, wow, Alan came up with that. <laughs> well, that was the big surprise. I mean, was... oh, I'm sorry, I was checking Twitter. Did you say something? <laughs> yeah, I just sent you a connection on there, by the way. <laughs> all right one of the other most and probably as off quoted lines as wide wide world of sports and the sheriff is near has to be excuse me while i whip this out (laughs) father have you ever walked up during the time to give your sermon and reached in for your notes and told your congregation excuse me while i whip this out well, let me see. I'm still a priest in good standing with my bishop, so no, I haven't. Well, I have no idea how progressive your uh, your area not, might be. You know, I mean, maybe they're into that, that kind of thing. But I'm just going to take a guess. <laughs> not, you're going to go. You're going to go out on a limb there. Shot in the dark. It is not that progressive. I've always said that I have very good job security, so long as I don't do something incredibly stupid. This would qualify as something incredibly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this, because we, you weren't here with us for the, the minutes of, uh, when they first were dealing with the, 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 the meeting in the, in the church about, you know, this town being stampeded. And there is a, a moment where they finish up and decide, hey, we're going to go ahead and wire the governor for a sheriff. And they decide that they're going to read from the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and Duck. I wasn't familiar with that last one. Well, it's an apocryphal gospel written in about the year 300, and uh, it just consider- consisted of the word quack over and over again. And so the, the it, it, <laughs> it was a bit daffy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, it was. You got it exactly. So the bishops decided that it didn't quite fit in the canon of scripture. Now, in all seriousness, though, have you ever, I mean, is there any other way to maybe uh, chase the parisher, parishioners out of the church than to say we're going to read from the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> uh, you, usually when I have to chase people out of the church, I'm just much more up front. I say, okay, everyone go home. Father has to go to bed. Father has to lock up. Everyone go home now. Go away. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> I, I have used that line, especially after midnight mass on Christmas. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Father is very tired because Walt and I talked about it. I mean, I'm used to getting a Bible verse, you know, generally one of the scriptures is read and then talked about. I've never been in any church and I've visited other denominations where they go, we're going to read from all four of the Gospels as part of our church service. That would really be something. I, I think it strains too, too much of human attention to be able to go through all four of those at once. To to say nothing of the stylistic differences between them, hey, there and there are differences. I was actually going to ask: Do you do you favor or have a a preferred gospel you like as far as your preference when you like to hmm. uh, use those lessons and those 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 words from the Bible and and those gospels when preaching to the to the congregation? Well, 
I don't know if I have a, a favorite per se. I, the the way it's it's set up in the Catholic Church, we have a, a three year cycle of readings that goes through about mm, I don't know sixty to seventy percent of the Bible, and so we get exposure to all four of the Gospels over the course of those three years. So I'm familiar preaching on all of them, and as things come up that have parallels in other Gospels. I'll point out, well, now in Mark's version of the story, this is what happens because this is what Mark is trying to communicate to his audience, whereas Luke is trying to say this to his audience because of this that's going on and so on and so forth. I think in my personal prayer, I, I probably, <laughs> I actually probably favor Mark's gospel the best because it's very punchy. It has a very active style. Jesus is always on the move. Every single scene begins and immediately Jesus said, and immediately then Jesus went on to do this. Bam, 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 bam. Just constantly moving from one thing to the next. Jesus is a man on the move in Mark's gospel. It gets you fired up. So that'd be like the, the, the tone we have here for Blazing Saddles, constantly on the go. Bang, 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 bang. So there we go. You've heard it. If you like Blazing Saddles, you're going to like the gospel according to Mark. I think we can draw a very bright line connecting those two things. <laughs> um, I've got the script here in front of me, and there's a couple of things that are different. But one thing is definitely the same uh, when it comes to some of the direction that I had never noticed until we started to slow this down one minute at a time. Apparently, once the sheriff is supposed to walk up to the top of the of the platform, Gabby Johnson is supposed to be sitting there wide eyed. We never get a look back at him. We get all these close ups of all these, you know, mouth hanging open Johnsons throughout the town. Mm. But it's, according to the script, it was supposed to go to, to Gabby at one point, And all he was supposed to say over and over again is rabbit, 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 rabbit. <laughs> I have no idea why. But that's exactly how it's written in the script. <laughs> like almost like Gabby's having his version of a frontier stroke. <laughs> he's, he's having a nervous breakdown. Well, like so many of the things that we've read over the last two years that got dropped, I'm glad that got dropped. The next thing, and I could not find this anywhere. One of the stage directions says a woman holds her hand over her little girl's eyes. And I couldn't find that anywhere with him just walking up to the to the pulpit or to the to the to the stand there yeah the the best thing that we have in the the lower left hand corner of the scene you've got two mothers one's turning her son's face away another one's turning her daughter's face away so they don't see whatever it is that the sheriff's about to whip out oh you know this I, i'm sorry this is the direction before he says excuse me while i whip oh, this even out before this was all oh. supposed to be stage direction as he's walking up to write the sign and go and, and take to the uh to the lectern there or the the little uh place where he's going to give his little speech. So I didn't see anybody covering a kid's eyes. No, I don't I don't see it either. By chance, I mean something in the back of my mind has that little clip. It, was that on one of the um TV drop-ins that they didn't use in the Maybe. theatrical version? And I just don't remember it because we're looking at the theatrical version here because one other one was supposed to be a close-up of Olsen Johnson who Sheriff Bart will tip his hat to as he walks past him to take uh, to take his place before you giving out the line. Mm -hmm. And it says Olson Johnson slowly but silently mouthing the word. Wow. 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 But he doesn't make a <laughs> single motion with his mouth at all. No, they, they must have. They must have decided this. Just the stronger choice is to let this be a slow burn to really let the incredulity sink in. I agree. Yeah, I think so. And, and that's why I like going through the script, because we see how these writers conceived of the movie in the writer's room. But it often changes once you're on the set and you realize, OK, this is slowing things down or. Yeah, we don't need these inserts. We've already established the look and feel of the town. We don't need these extraneous things. We can uh -huh. get right to his line. But I did find it interesting that they had all of this specifically enumerated. In fact, and when I say enumerated, it says the townsfolk do as follows. One, Gabby Johnson, his tongue, the only thing wagging from his face, says revid, 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 revid. Two, a woman holds her hands over her little girl's eyes. Three, Olson Johnson slowly, silently mouthing the word wow, 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 wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it's very specific. It wasn't just townsfolk ad lib things like it was very, very specific. And then I don't see a single one of these anywhere in this for opening minute of the of minute 29. You just got to see what works. And you get into the scene and you have everyone in place and a, you know, a good director like Mel Brooks is going to know. OK, no, nope, that's not funny. Cut it out. We're going to do this instead. Walter. Yeah, I'm um, 
I'm really thinking through this this minute. Um, there there's a lot here, um, but and I was actually trying to find the outtake of that uh, of that girl or anything else from this scene. But I like the fact that they really just kept everybody dumbfounded and that they really didn't go into all mm-hmm. the wow 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 or anything like that. I think just kind of the the silence and letting him give the guy the stink eye, tip his hat to the lady as he walks up, and then take the pulpit and take over. It makes the crowd's reaction first to him whipping something out and then uh, them getting all their guns out as they whip some things out. That makes those reactions pop and feel much stronger by having the stunned silence last for as long as it does. I agree. I think in terms of cinematic if they had done additional inserts after they'd already done the inserts of his ride into town, we've already done that. We've already gotten the close-ups of different towns. folks. We've gotten the reactions. We don't need it again. It's better to actually see the medium shot and everyone's still just still staring with incredulity as what is going on here? Who is this guy wearing a sheriff's badge that has no business wearing a badge in our eyes? You know, and I, I like that, as you said, the slow burn of watching their just, reaction as he ascends the stairs and then you have him whip out the decree from the governor (laughs) and so he appeals to that authority and kind of hopes that everybody's going to be on board as soon as he reads that and as he's reading it he realizes that is not the case by the power vested in me by the honorable william j lapetamain I hereby assume the duties of the office of sheriff in and for the township of Rock Ridge. Well, first you have all these great reactions to his line. The woman in blue faints, faints. backward into the band. The mayor covers his wife's face with his hat. <laughs> it's a really great crowd reaction shot here. And you do and you do have Mrs. Johnson kind of breathe a big sigh of relief and <laughs> <laughs> oh, woo, woo. Uh, there is actually a stage direction about a woman screams and faints and that is the woman in blue in front of all of those uh guys wearing the band uniforms and they do catch her so there is that stage direction that is kept in this medium shot after he says excuse me while i whip this out <laughs> but you're absolutely right you get multiple reactions from everybody in that crowd I'm I'm watching our sign puller, you know, hold his wife close to keep her safe from whatever's about to happen. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Now, I think uh, I'm going to go back again saying that I didn't think we needed the inserts as he was walking up because I love the fact that they saved the inserts for as he's reading to go all the close ups of all the guns being cocked and loaded. And the and his eyes. (laughs) As he as he looks from side to side, great <laughs> eye acting in, in this scene. Very much. Because like, he looks to his left, we get the insert of a guy cocking his gun. Then he cuts to the right, guy cocking his rifle. You know, it's very active that it goes back and forth, back and forth. And suddenly, I don't know about you, but watching the movie and from the editing now, I'm up there feeling as anxious as Bart. Yeah, because you do. You he does a great job just with his face of turning it from pure comedy and pulling you into the tension. And it's also the first moment where he realizes maybe things are not going to go as smoothly as I thought. I might actually be in a little bit of trouble here. I think that's why, at least for me, I'll ask you guys your opinions, why he rapidly tries to finish reading his declaration, <laughs> hoping that that might give some, I don't know, sense of, hey, I'm the sheriff. The governor sent me. This is for real. You can't do what you're about to do. Let me get this out quickly. This is totally legit, guys. <laughs> <laughs> to use some Wild West lingo, some authentic yes, frontier gibberish. Totally that, legit. that is definitely Wild West gibberish. <laughs> oh, Father Maori now is taking care of the youth of the church. <laughs> hey, fellow kids. What's up? Let's dish. Hey, fellow kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like a regular priest. I'm a cool priest. That definitely sounds like the way the new youth minister introduces himself. <laughs> oh, for sure. Wearing his, his blue jeans with his tucked in polo shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And Bir- I know. Birkenstocks. Uh-huh. And, yep. Oh, Sits down in the chair backwards. 
<laughs> hey, fellow kids, what's the haps? <laughs> what's the deal with your parents? <laughs> Hey there, Mary Sue. Those those eyebrows are on fleek, let me tell you. So, do y'all like Pearl Jam? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, that would be us, I'm Walt. Very <laughs> that would be us trying to relate to kids. We're like, so, uh, what do you guys think about Bananarama? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we in for a cool, cool summer? Huh? Huh? I wear my sunglasses at night. You'd hear all the kids pull out their weapons. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was expecting when I was watching this scene in detail. I thought we would have the the women and the kids in the crowd also training their guns onto Bart, but it's just the men. Yeah. Only the men folk here. Well, we have some standards in the That's old right. west. Uh, apparently. A, a admirable restraint in a Mel Brooks movie. Oddly, they got history right a couple of times by accident here. <laughs> Well, we do say all the men, but apparently the band is not allowed to carry weapons. Oh, how funny would it have been for them to be pointing the trombones at him? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. We get a, we get a, a clutch sound as, as they, they pull the trombone slide out, out and in. <laughs> <laughs> Emptying the spit valve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the look he gives as the camera pulls back because it's a close up on him finishing up the words and the camera pulls back and you've got everybody, including you've got Higgins on the one side, Olson Johnson on the other side, guns both in each of his ears. Mm. And that's where Reverend Johnson tries to get control of the situation. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let us not allow anger to rule the day. As your spiritual leader, I implore you to pay heed to this good book and what it has to say. <laughs> Son, you're on your own. So, Father Maury, this is where we get to ask you to step in on this one. Talking, uh, trying to get control of the, the emotions of the crowd using the Bible. I want, to, I want you to weigh in when you watch this and try to see how Reverend Johnson is doing at least what he's trying to as a man of the cloth. I certainly admire what he's trying to do. He is appealing to the better angels of their nature and uh, trying to call to mind eternal truths that transcend uh, things such as racism and these other very human problems that we continue to grapple with. Now, the way he goes about it is very confrontational. It's very direct. Uh, I don't know what a better pastoral approach would have been in this situation. Uh, And I, I, I'm glad that he appealed to the authority of the Bible and not to his own authority because then he would get shot and that that would not have <laughs> that would not have gone well. We find ourselves uh going through this movie and I try to ask our guests as well as each other when when it comes up the first time if you can remember the first time seeing the movie this was one of those other visual sight gags the idea that somebody actually shot the bible straight through the hand of the preacher because they didn't want to hear anymore. We're done. We're not going to listen to this. We're going to do what we want to do was so funny to me as a kid just oh my god they shot the bible and you got all these little all the paper comes fluttering around him from being shot by someone we don't see who it's just all of a sudden there's a big hole blown right through it now as as a man of the cloth i i shouldn't find the desecration of the bible funny but i do (laughs) it's it's so well executed and and i i'm going to remain in ignorance as to whether that's a real bible or not uh i'm i'm assuming of course it's not a bible they wouldn't actually destroy a bible for the purposes of a joke but even the idea of it yeah it's it's a total taboo but it's really funny (laughs) do you remember the first time seeing it i know you said you were younger your parents introduced you to the movie do you remember a reaction seeing that you know i i never did you know and i part of that i think is because of my Catholic background. Yes, the Bible is important, but it's not the be all and end all. It much worse would have been, you know, something that happened, God forbid, during the celebration of mass that would have really, Oh, Oh, wait, hold on. Oh no. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the shooting of the Bible. Yeah. It, 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 it elicited a laugh from me at the time. I don't remember being too scandalized by it. And if, you know, my, uh, observant Irish, Irish Catholic mother was okay with me seeing it. It couldn't have been that bad. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about you? Do you remember the, your reaction the first time seeing the movie or in your youth watching that scene play out? Cause 
for me, that was the first time I ever saw anything like that. I had never seen anybody for comedic effect take a preacher and basically say, shut up, preacher. I, I would have to say that was the first for me. And I remember thinking it was funny. But looking back on it, I'm really surprised that there hasn't been more of an outcry about that um, with deference to some of my um, Protestant friends. There are people who really kind of worship the Bible, and I'm I'm really surprised that there wasn't more um, more said about that when I was a kid. Because man, they talked about everything else. You know, music was hmm. terrible and evil. And um, I remember one of the big complaints against Jim Jones, uh, even after he Kool Aided his whole cult to death, was that they knew he was bad because he threw the Bible one time. So. Walt, I am just amazed how your mind works. <laughs> Goes from the Reverend Johnson to Jim Jones. <laughs> no, sorry, Father. Did we get to Jim Jones and Kool-Aid? Well, because I'm surprised that the people who were mad about Jim Jones throwing the Bible more than they were mad about Jim Jones killing his entire cult, I'm surprised they have never said anything about the Bible getting shot in this scene of this movie. <laughs> uh, it, it just kind of, and, and my other former, well, I'm not going to say what denomination, but um, hmm. my some friends that I grew up with when I was in another denomination, um, this would have been really offensive to them. Um, and, you know, to me, I understand what they're saying, you know, and, and it's funny. And it's an indication to me that they're going, we don't care what authority you're speaking on. We are not having this. And um, so I, I think they would miss that that joke and that very pointed commentary mm -hmm. for the fact of being offended by the Bible getting shot. All right. Have you ever thought about running for office? Cause that wasn't what I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> I just say what I feel like saying. <laughs> Cause I asked, do you remember what you thought? Maybe you did. Maybe you did answer it. You went right to Jim Jones. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to end it, it right there. <laughs> I, I, I answered it by saying yes. <laughs> I do remember. And, and I do think it was funny. I, I thought it was very funny. And I, I loved his reaction to it, particularly of just going, well, that's all I got, folks. You're on your own. Well, <laughs> moving right along. Let me uh, let me dive into the script here, because there are some additional lines that were left out. And I think it'd be fun to see. I know we're going to take him a little off guard because I didn't give him a heads up that this was coming. But I will. I want to read you a line, especially Father uh, Father Mowry here about what Reverend Johnson was supposed to say. Okay. He does get out the lines as written. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let's not allow anger to rule the day. As your spiritual leader, I implore you to pay heed to this good book and what it has to say. Then he's supposed to add, especially those instructions handed down to us by Abraham, Isaac, and Solomon. What? So my question, if you can off the top of your head, what is he referring to? Pay heed to this good book and what it has to say, especially those instructions handed down to us by Abraham, Isaac, and Solomon. Well, there's a I, there's a good reason that line was cut because I can't possibly imagine what that could mean. Abraham and Isaac are not teaching figures in uh, in the story of Genesis. They're recipients of God's promises and covenants, but they don't hand down teachings. Moses teaches. Abraham and Isaac hmm. don't. Now Solomon, he he teaches there's, you know, the whole book of Proverbs is, is is attributed to Solomon, as is the book of wisdom. So that Solomon, all right, that tracks. That makes sense. But Abraham and Isaac, oh, I'm I'm flummoxed. But there but even the wisdom that's given doesn't really have I, I mean, like I'm trying to think of the direct application here that Yeah, I couldn't think of anything. When I read the script, I was like, why would he bring up these unless they were just names that most people would know? Uh, that that makes the most sense to me. I mean, there are many proverbs about not letting anger master you uh, and, and acting with justice and rightly towards the uh, – and again, but that's uh, – acting with justice and acting rightly towards uh, the alien, the widow, and the orphan. But again, that's in the latter part of the first five books of the Bible when Moses is handing down the, the commandments of the covenant to the people of Israel in the desert. So that's not Abraham and Isaac. What a strange line. Very strange. Mm -hmm. Then, Walt, I'm going to give you a stage direction. You're going to tell me what's wrong with this, because according to the scriptwriters, a loud shotgun blast suddenly blows a hole through the center of the Bible. 
Uh, yeah, no, he would have blown half the people off the stage. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially since at the time they called them scatter guns, mm-hmm. and they are not quite that accurate. That's why you used them for close range. You didn't have to do anything but point in the general direction of who you wanted to hit. That's right, and they didn't have a good enough choke system on them at the time to really concentrate that shot. No, when I look at the shot that blows a hole through the Bible, it's definitely a bullet hole. It is nowhere oh, close yeah. to a shotgun blast. Well, and if you look at the guns that are in that audience, um, they're all the uh, Colt Single Action Army forty five pistols and the Winchester Model 1876 rifles. So there isn't a shotgun to be seen, but those guns and everybody fires, they would have done that, that exact damage to that Bible. Right. So it's definitely a bullet, not a shotgun. Mm-hmm. And I will continue. Reverend Johnson had more, he was supposed to say. And maybe, I don't know how we'll tie this all together, because right after he says, those instructions handed to us by Abraham, Isaac, and Solomon, suddenly, <laughs> unfortunately, those instructions are now somewhere over Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Then, <laughs> then goes to Bart, the line we do get, son, you're on your own. But then he's supposed to say, I must take shelter so as to preach another day. And then, according to the stage direction, crouches down into a little ball at the base of the platform. <laughs> oh, that's too much. You don't need that much. It's, it's too much. Yeah. Uh, that's, but what, that's too much. Especially given the line reading we have in the cut of the film, it is perfection. It is so good. A little eyebrow cock at the end of the line and walking away from the whole situation, washing his hands of it. Yeah, a bit of a Pontius Pilate move, I think. A bit, yeah. He's, he's not a very good preacher, is he? <laughs> no, I don't think no, so. No, he really isn't. <laughs> uh, I, do, I, I don't know where along the line, but I think self-preservation isn't supposed to be one of the top mandates of being a leader of a flock. Something about laying one's life down for one's friends comes to mind. I think someone important said that somewhere along the line. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, if I could only remember that guy's name. It'll come to me. <laughs> it's just eventually. Well, that's where the minute's going to end. So I just wanted to get into the script because I found it interesting that there were these added lines the preacher was, or Reverend Johnson was supposed to say, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Looks like our, if our priest can't make heads or tails of it, then it's good that they went ahead and clipped them. And I think I agree as well. Pruning these stage directions and keeping it exactly as we have in the theatrical release was the right way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think Mm -hmm. they really nailed it. All right. Well, before I uh, get a chance to to ask our guests for any last thoughts about Blazing Saddles, uh, Walt, do you have any other notes that we glossed over in this minute? No, I think we covered it. And Father Mowry, any other notes that you had? Uh, Just uh, one last thing I wanted to point about the crowd. So as you look at the the medium shot and you've got all of the, the men in town pointing their guns at Bart, uh, there's one gentleman in a gray hat and a kind of a taupe suit, and he's standing like a proper duelist. He has his free arm back behind his back as he's pointing his revolver at Bart because he wants to present as narrow a profile as possible. He looks like a dandy. Mm-hmm. I see that. Yeah, very much with the hand at the small of his back, and mm-hmm. he's, like you said, he's, he's standing nearly uh, sideways. Even as a member of an impromptu lynch mob, one has to observe proper etiquette. Well, I there suppose. is a sense of decorum here if you're going to yeah, shoot somebody dead. Yeah, you've got to be a gentleman about it if you're going to be a racist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman racist. Oh, dear. All right. Well, Father Maury, this is our last minute we have you. So uh, I always like to do this with our guests when they have their final moment. Just in general, your closing thoughts about the film Blazing Saddles, not necessarily just the two minutes that you were on with us, but. The film in general, you're, you get a chance to take the stage for a moment and give us your thoughts. I greatly enjoy Blazing Saddles. Uh, there are still jokes that my brother and I quote to each other to this day from uh, seeing the movie with, uh, with my family growing up. Uh, it is a movie that I'm always cautious to recommend to people who haven't seen it for the first time because it, it does come from a different sensibility. It, it comes from... A, a different way of treating this kind of material that strikes us as a little disrespectful, as, as not properly informed by what we agree should be the way things are done. But I think it has very important things to say by its use of satire uh, about racism, about the structure of society. Uh, and, you know, it's also so blasted funny. <laughs> Just the jokes come thick and fast and they are nailed to perfection. 
And uh, the oh, the only thing that I don't like about Blazing Saddles is the ending. It just, it, it just Mel Brooks has a slight problem of not knowing how to end his films. It's the one thing I, I think he drops the ball on as a director. Um, but with the playing with the the Western tropes, I think that ending where everything goes to complete bedlam and we break down the fourth wall almost literally uh it plays it leans on the the western tropes as a uh yeah at this time a slowly dying uh genre in hollywood movies mm-hmm. well i will strongly encourage you to come back and visit those minutes when we get to them later this year because i think i can help explain what mel brooks was doing hmm. i would be very interested to hear that explanation I would tell you now, but then people are going to then I'm going to let the cat out of the bag and I won't keep him till the oh, end. Oh, no, no. You got to dangle that carrot out for him. Keep him keep him going. Excellent. Well, father, if somebody again, much like yesterday, somebody said, you know what? That guy sounds really, really cool. I'd love to reach out to him just to kind of have, you know, somebody I can pick their brain on various things, whatever you you are very active on social media. Where can people find you? Uh, I am on Twitter at Father Mowry. That's F R M O W R Y. Uh, I'm also in the Wilder Ride listeners group on Facebook. So feel free to connect with me there. And we love having you in our Facebook and our closed listeners group. It's great to have these little because you've got the public page, which is fantastic. Anybody can stumble across it. But to have that closed group, I think it, it frees people up to say, oh, okay. This isn't cluttering my feed. Yeah. People don't need to see what I'm saying. It's all within the group of people that love the same things. And we can all chat about movies. And it's all it's a very safe space for movies and, and Gene Wilder and things like that. And we love it. Absolutely. Walt, where can people? I just kind of uh, Father Maori also said. So where can people learn more about us besides our Facebook page? Well, you can go to hillbillydictionary.com. Oh, wait, that's I'm sorry. That's something else I'm working on. Oh, my God. I took a sip of coffee. Just <laughs> <laughs> God. Got him. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Have you ever had coffee come out of your nose? Oh no. Oh my god. Sorry, I'll say gosh. And oh, the, it hurts. <laughs> the sins the wild ride. <laughs> we go out on a cloud of coffee. Oh my god, it hurts. <laughs> okay. Well, I love you, man. <laughs> well if i'd known you're about to take a drink of coffee i wouldn't have said anything oh i, w- I should have known better <laughs> <laughs> all right so where can people learn a little bit more about us and i'm keeping my cup down <laughs> the best place to learn about us is as just mentioned in our listeners group go to facebook.com slash the wilder ride uh follow us there and then you'll have the option to join the listeners group And you just have to answer a couple quick questions just to make sure you're a living, breathing human being. And then you will be a part of the group and you can comment. You can read all the other past comments. You can see some of the stuff people have posted. And one of the things I really like about that group is that it's now not even really been limited to Gene Wilder or the movies we're working on. But people have started posting some other entertainment stuff that has been uh, really fun to catch up on and read. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great conversational piece. I look forward to whenever I see a little little uh, red number next to that says, oh, people have posted since the last time you were on. I definitely want to dive in there and check that out. So folks, join it. Be part of the conversation. We love having you guys out there and come back tomorrow, Friday. We're going to close out the week here with minute 30. We're going to have a new guest join us, a radio guy who's got a, a heavy sports background, but he's also a radio broadcaster. Kevin Carroll will join us for starting out the minute with guns still out and we'll end the minute with hit me. Somebody hit me. Well, oh my gosh, who else is being held up? Because that certainly wasn't Sheriff Bart, was it? To find that out, you're going to have to come back tomorrow for this, The Wilder Ride. Brought to you by (laughs) hillbillydictionary.com. Also by (laughs) Clean Your Sinuses Out with Alan's Coffee. (laughs) Oh my God, have one of those snake oil tents set up. (laughs) Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, get your nasal cleaning right here. (laughs) This here's a genuine coffee neti pot. (laughs) A neti pot. We actually use an actual pot of coffee. (laughs) It'll burn every nose hair and take care of all those sinus problems. You won't be able to smell, taste, or do anything with the mouth, but we'll have you cleaning out everything. (laughs) Oh, the burning means it's working, son. (laughs) You'll forget your sinus discomfort with... (laughs) Oh, see how hard it is to talk that fast? (laughs) See, he's Walt. Walt's a little slower. Well, go ahead and talk slower, and I'll speed you up later. 
there's I'll just fix no it in post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fix it in post. There you go. We had Father Long Mass and Father Short Mass. <laughs> oh, <laughs> please. It doesn't hold a candle to my favorite priest nickname. There's a priest in my diocese who shall remain nameless, but he is known in the diocese as Father Zippity Duda. <laughs> <laughs> But, now, uh, you know, I, I don't mind a, a nice, well-fleshed out service, but the reason we had called them Father Long Mass, we were used to the 60-minute service, in, out, done, one hour. You could always book on it, unless you had Father Short Mass, and then it was 45. But hey. Father Long Mass, dear Lord, it'd be an hour and a half. I'm like, isn't there another service coming in behind us? Shouldn't we be out of uh, here? People are going to be angry about parking. Yes, the parking lot where Christian charity goes to die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the buffet, too. <laughs> Well, you, you and your buffets, I, those, those are dangerous places. I better stay away from them. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you've ever met Walt, but <laughs> the most dangerous place to stand is between you and the all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs>